Debbie Montgomery Johnson, the founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making, we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources, so that no matter where you are in your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smile and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. Good morning, good everybody. The, well, I say good morning because it's good morning for me, and it's a beautiful day in South Florida and Miss Canada. It is really warm and hot down here, but lovely. No snow, just sunshine, and tomorrow starts the first day of tax-free day for hurricane preparation. So those of you that live down here, and our guest does, please get ready for hurricane season. I hear it's going to be quite a whopper, but be prepared and you shall not fear. Before I start the show today, I just want to do a shout out to my friend, Sammy Blindell. Sammy is from the UK. She and I have known each other for a few years, and I was a guest on her summit yesterday called Ripple Fest Quest. And you can go there at ripplefestquest.com. I had the opportunity to share uh, my story, and the topic yesterday was called Own Your Gift. And it was about owning your story, owning your life, and being able to share to share it, which is exactly what we're going to do today. And it was an incredible, incredibly vulnerable opportunity for the women and the men that were on the show yesterday, but what fun and to share across the pond is our goal. It's always our goal to, to take our message and, uh, and meet with people across the pond. So I just want to say thank you to Sammy. If you get a chance to go to ripplequest.com, check out uh, her series this week. Uh, it's really fantastic. And what prompted that topic, Own Your Gift, is that I have a new book coming out, and it's called A Gift Called Fearless. The day she discovered she was fierce and strong. And I'm really excited because I haven't really thought about being fearless, except when I was standing on top of a pole and jumped and caught the trapeze and was doing my Tinkerbell move. But as we, as we, as I was thinking about all the shows we've done in the last year and all the great guests we've had, including today's guest, who have come out with their story and they've been fearless in opening up. I'm thinking, yep, that's our mission. That's what we want to do. We want to stand up, speak up, be fearless, and just have, be purposeful in our mission. So that's going to come out soon, probably in June. It's my birthday month, and we'll let you know more about that. But speaking of fearless, my guest today, and I want to call her my young guest today because she's younger than I am, but she is... Wow, lived <clears throat> quite a life in a short amount of years and has had some incredible experiences which could have shut her down. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting, getting choked up here. Um, I'd like to introduce to you my guest today, Chrissy Dupree. Chrissy comes from, she's down in South Florida right now, Southern Florida. And Chrissy, are you there? I am. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. You know, it's it's really fun for me because you reached out to me on this one and wanted to share your story. And I'm looking at it going, I haven't heard that story in public. But absolutely, do, does she, this one young woman, have some grit and some guts? And thank you for being our guest today. I'm glad to be here. We're going to kind of have a conversation. And I like to do this with my guests. We, it's not rambling because I do have a direction. But I'd like to start from when you were young, and especially in, their, in your story, because a lot happened when you were young. But can you tell the audience, like, where did you grow up, and what was your family like? Did you have brothers, sisters, mom and dad, that kind of stuff? Do you give me a short story? Yeah. 
So I was born and raised in New Jersey um, at the Jersey Shore, um, Seaside Heights, actually. Um, my, I have my mom and dad, and I, I'm one of four. So I have an older brother, um, then there's me, and then I have a younger brother and a younger sister. We grew up typically, for the most part, um, in a really nice neighborhood, and everything was going good, only at, at that, I thought, only um, – <clears throat> There was a lot of dysfunction, a lot of domestic violence, a um, lot of, dr- like, drug addiction, um, that kind of stuff that caused my family to uh, lose our house that we uh, were living in, and then we had to move to Seaside, um, which w- is a small resort town. Um, yeah, and that's, that's where most, you know, of my story starts. <laughs> What did you like to do as a kid? Were you athletic? Did you like to read music? I like to get an idea. Of I love, I love to read, um, and I love to be outside. When I was a kid, um, riding my bike. You know, back when I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones, and <laughs> um, it wasn't it wasn't like today. So um, I love to be outside. I actually used to do like little talk shows. Um, I had like a hand recorder, and I would mm-hmm. make my uh, I would like pretend I was the host and. I would do stuff like that, and um, I wrote, I journaled a lot when I was when I was younger. What was your experience like with your with your siblings? Because we I'm one of four. Close. I'm one of four, and it, it's fun. I had three brothers. We were Is very there... very close. <clears throat> me and my brothers and sisters were very close. Um, me and my younger brother, he's uh, two years younger than me, and me and him were, you know, people used to call us twins. We looked alike growing up, and we spent a lot of time together. Um, You know, the four of us kind of had to really be there for each other, so we just kind of bonded. And we we hung out with all the kids from the neighborhood, and we were kind of a group. So, you know, we were always together, always together. So safety in numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, if if somebody was one of our friends, they were all of our friends, and it was always like a big group of friends. Okay. We were always hanging out, riding bikes going down to the creek, that kind of stuff. <laughs> stuff well, kids don't do today. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. It's taking me back to Vermont. Yeah, they don't do it today. And, and parent, we're, we as parents were scared, scared to let our kids out to do those kinds of things, Yeah, which is unfortunate. So lead us to your teenage years, my dear, because that seems to be the start of your, of your story that you'd like to talk about. What, what happened here? So uh, I was around 13. Um, my parents lost their house. Um, my my grandparents lived right next door to us, and they were the ones that actually built our house that we grew up in in Manchester, New Jersey, which is not far from Seaside. And due to the, the dysfunction and the drug addiction and the way that my parents were, my grandparents had no choice but to sell the house and, you know, kind of wash their hands of the situation. Um, they were a big part of raising us and helped as much as they could, but it got to a point where they just couldn't watch it anymore. So my parents then moved us to Seaside. We went from a, you know, three-bedroom giant house to a small three-bedroom condo, and this was the first time that me and my brothers and sisters were um, ever, like, introduced to this. Like, we uh, were like, what is going on? Like, we're in this tiny little apartment in this resort town, which is pretty much a, you know, playground for any teenager. Um, anything that you wanted was right at your access. Um, the boardwalk, the rides, um, you know, everything there. So me and my brothers and sisters, my family, we moved into Seaside, and, you know, we started to get acclimated. We, we started to meet people in the neighborhood, and it seemed that um, all the other kids in the neighborhood were kind of going through the same thing, which is we had our mom and dad, but they weren't really present. Um, and we ended up, you know, making family basically with the other kids from the neighborhood, and we got introduced to things, um, you know, marijuana, drinking alcohol, um, you know, that kind of stuff at 13, 14 years old. Um, And my parents weren't, you know, they were there, like I said, but they were not involved. They, you know, I remember being 13 and my mom renting a hotel room for me and a bunch of my friends to hang out in. Um, you know, she was, she was an enabler to the dysfunction. And, uh, you know, living this kind of life, naturally, I started skipping school, met a 19-year-old man 
um, and started hanging out with him. My mom found out about it, and I remember her telling me, it's okay, go sleep over his house. Um, I'll hide it from Dad. You can go. I was 14. Okay. Um, this, man, this man was 19. Um, so I did, you know, at 14, your mom's telling you it's okay to go. So I did. I mean, he was cool. He had a car, you know, he, you know, and so that's what I did. And needless to say, I lost my virginity, um, which I remember wanting to hold on to. Um, and I remember very young back then before I even had kids, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to go to school. I, I remember wanting to get, be better. I remember like thinking those thoughts, but unfortunately, you know, it's just, as a teenager, you're having fun. You don't really care what's going on. Um, and I lost my virginity and ended up getting pregnant. And, you know, this man was not stable. He has mental issues, and he was abusive. And, um, you know, it was, it was crazy because I remember when I took the pregnancy test, I was in the bathroom, and I remember the, I just had just turned 15, and I took the pregnancy test, and my mom was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be a grandma, and she was so excited. And oh. I remember thinking, what am I going to do? My life is over. So I ended up, um, I remember, you know, not knowing what to do, um, but I ended up having my daughter. But I did, due to the abuse from the father, <clears throat> um, I went into labor at 28 weeks. So she was born at two pounds, seven ounces. I had just turned 16. I didn't even have a driver's license yet. When I went into labor, I was rushed to the hospital. I re they told me that I had almost died. They didn't think the baby was going to make it, um, but she did. And she got air backed to a different hospital that was over an hour away from where I was. So here I am, 16, just came out of surgery. I didn't even know she was a girl. The doctor came in and was like, your daughter's okay. She's at a different hospital. And I was like, oh, it's a girl? Like, I didn't even know. That's how early in my pregnancy I was because they didn't have the technology today that they had 23 years ago. Uh, and I couldn't even get to her because I couldn't drive. So I had to, you know, once I recovered from my C-section and the surgery, I had to depend on other people to get me up to the hospital. And she was in the hospital for three months. Um, so she finally came home and, you know, I was dealing with, you know, apnea monitors, doctor's appointments, um, premature baby. And here I am 16 and I had the school tutor come to my house because I was like determined to not drop out of school. And we were living in a tiny, tiny, I think it was maybe, maybe 600 square feet, maybe I don't even think it was that big, two-bedroom apartment. It was my mom, my dad, my brother, my two brothers, my sister, me, and now the new baby. Um, so it was hard. Shortly after she was born, um, same man, um, I ended up pregnant again. So now I'm pregnant again, and I have this new sick baby, and I'm pregnant again. So I still continue to try to go to school, um, but the fact that I didn't have stable and safe daycare for my daughter. Uh, my parents were very manipulative. They would only babysit for me if I would give them money, if I would, you know, if I, if I would, uh, they would want, you know, access to drugs. They would tell me that I would have to go to the hospital and tell them that my back hurt to get them pain medicine or they wouldn't babysit for me. Um, so it got to a point where I had no choice. And in my beginning of ninth grade, I dropped out, and I was devastated. Um, had my son full term, and so now here I am with two children, and dropped out of school, and I was determined to get my GED. Um, my daughter ended up being diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Um, she wasn't walking. So I was able to get her on disability. Um, her check was about like $500 a month, but back then that was a lot of money. And for me, it was amazing because it helped a lot. Um, and I kind of saw like a stable income where maybe I could get out on my own and get my own place. Uh, I got, I, sorry, I'm like 
skipping around. But my GED. So I wanted my GED. So I did apply through the Lakewood uh, Night School down in up in Jersey, and I took the test and I failed um, the math. I passed everything but the math. <laughs> so I went back again. You're allowed to take it, you know, again. A couple weeks later, I went back. I failed again. Um, so then I was like, okay, I'm going to study. Because I'm, here I am with an eighth grade education level, and I'm taking this test that I, I never was taught any of these things. So I, obviously that's why I was failing. Um, so I taught myself. I went to the library. I got the book I with my kids, took them with me, <laughs> went to the library, and um, was, you know, taught myself the math, went back, and I passed. And I only passed by, like, two points, but I passed. I didn't care. I was very happy. Um, so I got my GED. And for me, that was kind of like, okay, like, right now, Maybe I can't do anything with my life, but maybe in the future I will be able to. So I just kind of held on to that for a little while. And can then... I, can I ask you a question first? During this period of time, how did people around you treat you? Did you get any... Sh um, and were there people shaming you for what you did, or oh, did yeah. you have support? The hardest part for me was going to doctor's appointments um, with my daughter because they looked at me like, like this is, you're a child. Um, you know, back then I didn't even think about it, but I look back now and I'm like, wow. Like, I would go to doctor's appointments and they would talk to me like I didn't understand what they were saying. Um, I always felt judged. I didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have the best of everything. Um, you know, so it, the only people around me that really didn't judge me were my close friends. They helped me. They supported me. They were always there with me with my kids. Um, my sister, my sister was a big, big part of my kids growing up because it was always me and her. Um, <clears throat> she kind of followed in the same footsteps as I did and ended up moving out of my parents' house at 14 to live with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't get pregnant, but she was, you know, I, I took care of her um, and always, you know, always had her around and she was always helping me with my kids. But yeah, it was it was constant judgment, um, especially being pregnant. Because when I was pregnant with my daughter, I I was still in school and I would go to school pregnant, and it was you know people would look at me and. Well, year, years and years ago, you get pregnant and you would go away for nine months and then come back and poof, you know, where'd you been? Well, I was on vacation. Um, and then when I was young, I remember the first the first girl in high school that I knew that got pregnant, and boy, there was terrific shame, and, you know, she wasn't a close friend of mine, uh, but I remember the way people treated her, and I was just, as I was listening to her story, and you were talking about your, your, your daughter, and then three months later, you got pregnant again, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are they saying now, you know, yeah. <laughs> but first yeah. off, where was your, where was your mother, but apparently your mother enjoyed being a, a grandmother, but, you know, at that point, it's like, wow, you know how this happened, but maybe you didn't. I mean, physically you did. But to be a parent, it, it takes a lot more than, you know, that we all know that now. Um, but I, I'm sure there were people around that. But how did you get past them and not listen to them? Because I love what we put up for the, the topic of, this, of your conversation is put the noise behind you. How did you put yeah. that noise behind you and move forward? My children, the only thing that got me through then and got me through raising them was that they deserved better than I had and they deserved better than what I was giving them and I knew that and keeping them with me because, what, you know, keeping them with me and safe. I didn't care about anything else. I mean, I, I knew that I was going to eventually give them stability and a better life, and focusing on that is honestly, like, as long as I had my kids with me, I was okay mm -hmm. because it was me and them. And, you know, when my parents would be screaming at me or we were moving again because they didn't pay the rent or, you know, I was standing in line at the food pantry to get my kids' food, if I had them with me, sorry, I get upset, um, I was okay. I was okay, and... Nothing else mattered. It didn't matter to me. Were you ever worried about the state coming in or somebody not yeah, finding you all fit the time. for people? My mother, I think DIFUS, they call it DIFUS in Jersey, now it's DCF. I think DCF, I think my mother called DCF on me, um, I think it was like 37 times throughout my life. Oh, my. <clears throat> to what yeah. end? 
so she, um, I never lost my children. Nothing ever came of it. Um, they, you know, they would come out. They would do their, they would actually offer me help. <laughs> um, but they, my mother was always trying to get custody of my children because she wanted them for food stamps and yeah. for my daughter's disability check. So, wow. uh, yes. So I was constantly in fear. And even today, it's funny, I work very closely with DCF. And it's funny because my husband actually, like, tells me, like, you know, DCF's not coming to take your kids, but it's like a scar in the back of my mind. Like, and if, if we're loud in public or, you know, if I, if I discipline my kids, like, not hit them or anything, but, like, if, you know, I'm disciplining them, I'm like, oh, my God, like, what if they go to school and tell somebody they got punished or DCF's going to come? And my husband's like, so what? <laughs> but I'm like, you don't understand. Like, I have, like, this. Con- like this trauma from constantly fearing losing my children. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is really interesting because we'll talk later about what field you have gone into. But yeah. <laughs> before we get there, um, you talk about being safe and having the kids with you there, but you had something happen at home that blew that all up. What yeah. happened in your, in your home? Where were you living? Who was there with you? And what actually okay. happened? So... I was just turned 18. Actually, I wasn't even 18 yet. I was 17. And I found a very small apartment. It was $500 a month. It was a one-bedroom. And I convinced the landlord because he was hesitant. He was like, listen, you're a single mom. You're 17. You're not even 18 yet. Like, and I convinced him, like, I promise you, it's just me and my kids. I just need to get away from where I am. And he agreed, and he signed the lease for me. And I moved in at 17. Um, with my kids to a one-bedroom, very small apartment in Seaside. Um, and Seaside's set up like a resort town. It's a beachy town, so it's it's a bunch of houses, and then in each house is different apartments. Um, so I had a, a – it was a back apartment, and it was small. It was one, you know, entrance, and it was just a one-bedroom with a living room, kitchen, and bathroom. Very small, but it was perfect for me and my baby. Um, my daughter was two and a half at the time, and then my son, um, he was still in his port a crib so he was one they're they're 11 months apart so he was like one and I moved in and it was great I thought to myself you know here I have you know it's not it's not the Taj Mahal but it's uh, away from everything and I'm on my own and it's something that I can afford because I would waitress and bartend and um, my sister would help me babysit and and then I would get my daughter's disability check which paid the rent so <clears throat> it was like a good start for me I was there for only about maybe a couple months, maybe two or three months. Um, I had put the babies to bed in their bedroom, and I was sleeping on the couch. I had a bed in my room, but I just was, you know, I felt more comfortable sleeping on the couch in the living room. So I was on the couch in the living room, and it was around 3 o'clock in the morning. It was actually, it was weird, Memorial Day weekend. Um, I remember it was raining. It was storming pretty bad. Um and I had fallen asleep. I woke up around 3 o'clock in the morning to the sound of my bedroom door opening. Um, the door would stick, so it would make a loud noise, like a sticking noise when the door would open. So I woke up to that noise. And I thought that it was my daughter who had climbed out of her crib coming out to the living room. I got up and walked out of the living room into the kitchen and seen a man standing in the doorway. Mm. And instantly... I was like, who is that? Like, I'm half asleep, you know what I mean? I'm like, who is that? You know, I thought, I don't even know what I thought. Like, maybe my sister came or something, I don't know. But, you know, I don't know. And he immediately turned around, lunged at me, tackled me, threw me to the floor, strangled me, um, was strangling me. And I remember fighting. I was fighting. I was scratching. I mean, I had scratch marks down my, my neck. I was trying to rip his hands off my throat. And I remember kicking for my life, like I was kicking him so hard, um, and eventually he let up. He picked me up and put me in the living room, where he then sexually assaulted me. Mm-hmm. In the middle of the assault, <clears throat> my daughter had walked out, came crawling. She didn't walk out; she crawled out of the bedroom. I looked over and saw her sitting there, and she was just sitting there with her hands on her chin, like on her stomach, like watching. And I looked over at her, and I told her, "Mommy's okay." Mommy's okay. Everything's fine. Just stay right there. Mommy's okay. And I completely blocked out what he was doing. Um, I just kept talking to her, and she, thank God she stayed where she was. Um, 
after he was finished, I remember him taking a pillow um, and trying to put it over my head, and I was fighting, but then he stopped. And I don't know still to this day. I don't know why any of he did any of this, but I, he stopped. Um, he then picked me up off the couch, walked me over to my daughter, and he was standing behind me and pointed to her. And I was like, what do you want me to do? And he didn't say anything. And I said, do you want me to pick her up? And he said, uh-huh. So I picked up my daughter, and then he pushed us into the bedroom, and he put me and my daughter in the bedroom, and he shut the door. And then he was doing whatever he was doing in the apartment, and I sat on that bed, and I looked at my daughter, and she was looking at me. And I never in my life, still to this day, this was 20 years ago, have ever had more clarity. I remember thinking, how am I going to get out of this alive? Because my thought process was, he's going to come back in here and kill me. But if I jump out that window, he's not going to kill my kids because he knows I'm gone. And he doesn't know how long I've been gone. And he knows the cops are coming. So instead of killing my kids, he's going to leave. And this is all happening in a matter of like two minutes in my mind. My window was um, old school, crank window. So I knew that the lock, once I popped that lock, he was going to hear it. And I had like seconds. <clears throat> so I moved the TV that was in the way of the window and I kissed my daughter and I said, Mommy, is, my son was still sleeping in his crib through all of this. Um, I said, Mommy will be right back. You stay right here and you don't move. She didn't even talk yet. She was that you know, little. She just looked at me like, okay. Um, popped the window. I jumped out. It was pouring rain. I was barefoot. I was not necessarily second story, but I was pretty high. I remember getting lightning foot. That's what they call it. I remember jumping out the window and see it, my, my legs like gave out on me. So I was in an alleyway now and I ran to the gate to get out of the alleyway, but the gate was locked and it was locked from the other side or it was like a weird lock and it was one of those wooden gates. I couldn't get out of the alleyway. So now I'm like freaking out because I'm like, I only have a matter of time before he realizes I'm gone, he's going to come out the front door and grab me in the alleyway, and I can't. And if I'm loud, he'll hear the gate. So eventually I, like, took a breath, got the gate open. I ran out into the street, and I seen two men. Well, actually, first what I did is I went to the front neighbor's house and started knocking on their door quietly because I didn't want him to hear because I was in the back apartment, so I went to the front apartment, and I knew the couple started knocking on their door. I was knocking real quietly, hoping they would answer. They didn't answer. Eventually, I was like, okay, I can't knock any louder, and they're not going to answer. So I see two men walking down the street. Ran up to them, barefoot, beat up. It's raining. I said, help me. My kids are inside. I was just raped. Please help me. They said, there's a pay phone. Call 911. Oh, my gosh. And walked away. Yes. So, thank God there was a pay phone. I ran to the pay phone. I called 911. I told 911 what happened. They sent the deputies out. The police showed up quickly. I ran, ran over to the police, and I was like, please, my kids are inside. Like, that was all I cared about. The police let me go with them. When they walked in the house, they had their guns drawn, which, you know, I'm thankful for because normally they wouldn't let you, but they did. They had their guns drawn. When they went back and when they went, walked into the apartment, he had fled. He was gone. But my bedroom door was open, but my daughter was sitting at the window. So still to this day, I question, you know, he go back into that room and I could be dead right now. Um, or, you know, it could have been my daughter that opened the door looking for me, but I doubt it because she was still in the same spot that I had left her in looking out the window. And there they took me to the hospital and I got the same exam. And I, I can't say that I had a bad experience with law enforcement because they were amazing. Uh, amazing. And for as being as young as I was with two kids, you would think that they would judge me and you would think that, you know, it would have been a harder process. But my, the detective was, I mean, he was right there at the hospital and he was amazing. I mean, he didn't stop until this guy was caught. Anyway, that, was my, that was my next question. Yeah. Did they catch him? They did um, because I, I was very, I remembered what he was wearing and I knew his voice. He actually was somebody that I did know, but I didn't hang out with. He had a very distinct voice, and that was the reason that he, I'm assuming the reason that he didn't talk during the assault, and the only things that he said was no and uh uh-huh. And from that little bit, I was able to 
tell who it was, and then I said what he was wearing, and then they went and, you know, they did their investigation, and he lied. He said he was at work, and when he wasn't, they found the clothes I said he was wearing, and then it took two years, um, and my advocate called me with the DNA that I was right, and it was him. Wow. Yeah. Well, heck, the way you were fighting him, you should have had scratches or kick marks or something oh, on yeah. him. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, I had the scratches um, because oh. I was scratching to get his hands off my neck. Um, but they got DNA from the rape kit. There you go. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just I'm sitting here, and, and this is that moment where my insides are aching for you. I'm so sorry that happened, but I'm really grateful that you got that clarity and said, you know, get get safe, get the kids safe. And yeah. unfortunately, the kids were young enough, they probably don't remember any of this. They don't. They don't. Think, they know goodness. about it because um, it's a big part of my life, but they, yeah. they don't. They don't remember. So he was caught and prosecuted in jail, prison, nothing? What happened to him? Yes. <clears throat> so we went, he got arrested and was in, you know, in jail, you know, pending trial. Um, you know, he said he didn't know me and um, it never happened. And he had no idea what they were talking about. And then two years later, the DNA came back, and he was like, oh, yeah, it was consensual, and I was cheating on my girlfriend. I didn't want her to know. So we were like, okay, you sat in jail for two years. You didn't, you know what I mean? Like, you waited two years. Yeah, to that doesn't make sense. Right. But anyway, so we went to, we went to court, went to trial. It was hard. Um, I remember I had a breakdown on the stand. It was bad. Um, but we did get a conviction, and he was sentenced to 54 years in prison. Um, 54? After, 54 years, yeah. Oh, my. Um, after that, though, during the trial, one of the questions that mm, I think it was the prosecutor asked, the judge didn't object to, something was brought up, prior bad acts that weren't allowed to be, mm -hmm. and he actually appealed it and won. So he got his um, appeal, his trial, his conviction was overturned. So now, um, you know, I thought this was behind me started to move on with my life, prosecutor's office calls and says, we got to go to court again. Oh. And, like, he, he, his conviction was overturned. I'm like, are you kidding me? So now here I am going back to court date all over again, the whole process. Um, eventually he said, I don't want to take the chance of going back to trial. I'm going to plead guilty. And I agreed to a sentence of 25 years. Okay. Um, so he did his time, and he recently got out last year. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> How did you feel about that? I, I, I believe in God and I, you know, I trust in him and I know that that happened to me for a reason and a purpose. Yeah. And I've forgiven him and I'm not mad about it anymore. And I know selfishly that he'll never live a normal life. <laughs> Um, yeah. I believe he's already been violated on his parole because he didn't register um, as a sex offender. So in my thought process is he'll be back in prison. Mm -hmm. um, I just hope it's before he hurts somebody else. Um, but he has to pay for his sins, not me. Um, right. And at uh, some point, I don't, is there any, um, I don't know how, how they work with the victims and the perpetrators at that point, if, if there's any reconciliation or any, did you ever meet with him again or did he ever express remorse? I mean. No, the only thing is in, so it's a little different than Florida. In Jersey, he actually had to admit, admit his guilt when he took a guilty plea. So he did admit <clears throat> um, that he did it in court. And for me, that was more, I wanted that more than going to trial again. Yeah. For me, I was like, I want to hear, like, because all these people, like, you don't understand going through this trial how many people just said I was lying. Uh, how could I do this to him? He has kids. Uh, we were having an affair, and I just don't want to get, I don't want to admit it. Um, you know, and here I am, like, all I did was go to sleep on my couch. Like, I didn't do any, I didn't ask for this, you know. And a lot, I get it now why people don't report. I mean, the scrutiny from, I mean, it wasn't law enforcement, though. It was the people in the town. Um, you know, it made the papers. It was, I had reporters calling me. 
Um, you know, and then there was a point where he was in jail before trial, and the prosecutor's office comes to my house and tells me, hey, we intercepted a phone call. He's trying to get somebody to kill you before trial. So we need to know where you are, and you need, you need to be careful. So it's like, is this worth it? <laughs> like, I just want to move on with my life. So I was assaulted, and now I have to relive this experience, fear for my life, fear for my kids, battle all these people, go into court in front of strangers and tell my story. I can talk about it today like it's nothing, but back then when it's fresh, I didn't want to talk about it. So, I mean, it was, it was hard. What were the steps you <laughs> took to get past that? to get, not past it, to put it behind you, but to get through it, to move on. He's in prison. You're safe. The, he, you know, you got what you wanted when he admitted it. He was guilty. But now you had to be able to move forward. How did you do that? Because you've done it in an extraordinary way. I did nothing at first. I'm not going to lie. Put it behind me. I said, I have these kids to raise. I am living in poverty. I have, you know, no support. Um, I need to do what I have to do to survive. This is this part of my life is done, and I put it behind me, and I didn't deal with it um, for years. And I suffered with, I know now, PTSD. Um, I've been diagnosed with chronic anxiety due to it, um, nightmares. I still, to this day, wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning every night, mm. every night. Um, but I put it behind me until my anxiety got so bad I started going to doctors because I thought I was physically ill I thought I had MS I thought I had cancer um, I couldn't figure out why I had all these physical symptoms and um, we're talking 10 years later and the doctors kept telling me it's anxiety it's from what because I would tell them they were like do you have any stress has anything happened to you and I would tell them and then eventually I stopped telling the doctors because they immediately would be like, it's anxiety. And I'd be like, no, like something is medically wrong with me. It's not anxiety. And they kept, you know, I had MRIs, I had blood work, I had CAT scans, I had everything. And they could not, I mean, cardiologists, they could not find anything physically wrong with me. So finally I accepted like, okay, I think it's time that I deal with this. <laughs> um, and it was almost like I wanted something physically to be wrong with me so I didn't have to deal with what happened mm -hmm. um, because I knew. They kept, you know, I went to therapy throughout the years, and as soon as it started getting hard, I'd stop going. As soon as I started to have to actually deal with what happened to me, I'd stop going because it was, it was, I was fine. I was fine. I could walk around my life and live my life, and, okay, I was assaulted, and I would talk about it, and people would look at me like, what is, what, do you understand what you're saying, like what happened to you? And I'd be like, yeah, it's fine. It's like, whatever. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so then I finally accepted that I needed to go to therapy. Um, <clears throat> I <clears throat> got with my husband, who is the most supportive person in the world. Um, you know, he has supported me through the process of healing and accepting it and, you know, my schooling, and just every aspect of my life. And that's when I was able to start living and stop surviving, I was able to deal with it because I didn't have to deal with everything else and live in survival mode. So I was actually able to focus on me and what I needed to. And my husband was like, I got everything else, you deal with this. And I never had that before. I was never able to do that because I had to feed my kids and I had to move around because I couldn't pay rent or I had to find ways to transportation. It was, it was hard. So quick question. Finally, yeah. A lot of, a lot of the women that I, that we work with at SCARS, which is the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams. And this, you know, when I say SCARS in your case, in our case, you can't see them. So it's very difficult, like you said, to get past because people are like, well, you, you didn't get hurt. But they want to know how they can move forward again with another man in their life. And how did you meet your hubby? Um, and you just said he was one of your greatest supporters, as is mine. How did, you, how did you meet him, and how did you develop that trust in him? Oh, it was hard. Um, <laughs> I was working at Apple. I, I, <clears throat> I took my kids and moved up north to my, with one of my aunts who is pretty much my mom. 
my aunt is amazing. Um, she said, you know, you can't keep – I called her, and I was like, I can't keep doing this. My parents, like, every time I move, they just keep coming back in my life, and they're, you know, they're – I got to get out of here. Like, if I want any kind of stability for my kids, I got to get out of here. So my aunt welcomes me and my two kids into her house um, and, you know, put me into parenting classes. And I, w- I think I was, like, 23, 24 at this time. Um, you know, really gave me, like, the parenting – you know, skills that I needed, and she parented me. I mean, she taught me how to save money. She taught me, you know, different discipline, like I rules, things that I never had. Um, <clears throat> it was kind of like I was learning with my kids. <laughs> and I was working at the Applebee's up there, and my husband was stationed up there. And so he comes in, and he sits, you know, at a table with his friends, and I am like, oh, great, military guys, because I had dated a Marine for a little while, and he was awful. So I, I didn't want anything to do with military and his one of his uh, his boss <clears throat> that he worked with was like, give him your number. And I was like, no, I don't want to. Like, I, I don't want nothing to do with you guys, like, whatever. Like, I respect you, but I don't want to date you. <laughs> and uh, he came back the next day, <clears throat> and he was very persistent. Um, and eventually I gave him my number, and we started talking. But even then, I was very hesitant, um, but I fell in love with him very fast. Um, he, right away, what, he had two kids also, and I had two kids, so we had a lot in common. Um, you know, he had been through a lot in his life, and I had been through a lot, so it was just like we connected. Um, but I felt safe with him. I felt very safe with him. Um, and, you know, he's really really cute. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> hey, but and, I have a question. You know, I, when, when, did you, when did you tell him what happened? It was about like a month or two um, into the relationship, I, okay. I told him. And, and he actually, when I met him, we were actually in the process of, that was the time that we were going back to court for the, um, so I kind of had to tell him. Oh, I had to, yeah, there's no hiding that. Yeah. And he actually came to court with me. Yeah, we drove. I lived up with my aunt, which was three hours away from Seaside. It was up North Jersey in the mountains, Sussex County. Um, and he drove, you know, he drove with me down to court whenever there was court. Um, and he was right away, never doubted me, never questioned me, never, ever made me feel like he didn't believe me. Um, and he was just supportive from day one. Well, I thank you, and I thank your hubby, who I know is listening to the show, and go military guys, because they're some of the <laughs> some of the most trustworthy, wonderful men in my life, and uh, so I yeah, appreciate now that. Yeah, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> now you're a big military supporter. So you have survived this, and now you, you're doing some incredible work. You went from getting your GEP to completing your master's degree, or have you gotten it? Because if not, it's just soon. Yeah, so I graduated um, last Monday, actually, at the graduation, but I will have my official degree in hand August because I have to complete my milestone over the summer. But Well, congrats, so congratulations, and let everybody know what you're doing now because this is extraordinary that you've taken your pain and have made it into your passion. Yeah, so I um, am today the uh, Sexual Assault Response Team Coordinator for Monroe County. Um, I, you know, am also the community advocate here, so I assist with these sexual assaults, the SANE exams. I also coordinate the services for the county and keep the community partners updated on information, um, helping develop a protocol for the county. Um, and I, I just really love the fact that this position gives me access to the community. I get to do community outreach, fundraising events, I speak, I do training, but then I also get that direct service with the survivors themselves because I was them. And I get to sit with them through exams, and, and they're telling me that this is, they don't know how they're going to live, and they don't know how they're going to go through it, their life after this, and they just feel disgusting, and I can actually sit with them. And I don't make it about me, but I explain things to them in a way that they understand that there is life after this, and even though this person took that control from you. And, and today, it feels like there's no way out. There 100% is. And there's a team of people that want to support these survivors. And a lot of them don't know that there's all of these advocates and support systems out there. Um, so 
so I just kind of give them that guidance and give them the support and I give them resources and, and let them know like we're here and and a lot of them um, I have the phone with me 24 7 so they can call me and I tell them even if you can't sleep and you just want to talk we don't have to talk about your assault call me we'll talk about the weather tomorrow what your plans are just if you need somebody to talk to because that was one of my biggest things is that I needed that and I didn't have that my advocate through the state attorney's office or the prosecutor's office was amazing um, I'm actually still in contact with her today um, she's amazing, but she was the prosecutor's office advocate, and I didn't know that there were support groups. I didn't know, and I didn't really do much research to go out there and, and, and look for that stuff, but there's a lot of help out there for survivors, and a lot of them just don't know because they just want to push it away, and they don't want to look for it. So well, I that's a that's a really good segue. I'm gonna I do have Dr. Tim McGinnis on. Tim is the founder of Scars, which is the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams. We are an international victim support group, and so much of what you are saying uh, is the same as what goes on with the women and men that are coming to us uh, as victims of of online fraud. So, Dr. Tim, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> Uh, and, and technically, we are a victim's assistance organization as well as a crime prevention organization. There you go. But Tim, uh, the similarities between what Chrissy's talking about and what we work with on a daily basis. Uh, People go through terrible experiences in their lives, and the commonality between them is, is substantial. Uh, you know, obviously, Chrissy, you went through incredible trauma and eventually recognize that you had to deal with it because trauma does not cure itself and it can't be ignored it can't be it can't be buried in you know a bottom drawer in the closet someplace you have to drag it out kicking and screaming and and um, and and deal with it in order to be able to recover recover your life and and it's so commendable that you were able to do that. So many people are not. I remember sitting with a therapist and her looking at me and saying, you can keep running, but eventually you're going to have to deal with this. Like 20 years down the road, it's still yep. going to be there, and it's going to affect your life even if you're not thinking, hey, this is from my assault. And it did. It manifested in severe anxiety, and I thought I had, you know, I was having physical symptoms like I literally thought I was sick. So, you know, it does. It's a hundred percent true. It does. Even if it's even if your assault is behind you or your trauma is behind, and you're not thinking about it every day, if you don't deal with it, it it's there. And, and and one of the hardest things about being a victim's advocate is the recognition that we know it's there, but potentially a majority of victims will deny it, or they'll express it in terms of of other personality challenges, everything from uh, rage and anger against those that are trying to help them. But the most tragic part is those who respond by saying, I'm fine. It's, it's, it's a kind of denial, but it's an insidious, cancerous kind of denial. And you deny yourself. It becomes life-threatening in a, in a manner of speaking. You know, there, there are people who have gone through this trauma in their lives. Robin Williams is a good example of this. To the outward, to the world outside, his outward appearance was he was perfectly fine, but he was experiencing this trauma internally to the point that he just could not deal with it anymore and took his own life. In our world, the world of online crime victims, our estimates are that we lose about 12 to 20 people every single day to suicide. We, we estimate this because we're able to rescue, in a manner of speaking, about one person a day. But the great challenges in, in all forms of victims' advocacy are the people that we just can't help because they won't let us. Yeah. In our space, we think that's a majority of victims, somewhere between 60, 70, maybe as high as 80% of victims. And even the people who come to us 
and join our support groups and, and the like, the majority of them will not actively participate in their own recovery. And it's sad. But we do what we do. We continue to plow forward because if we can save one person, then that's enough. And, you know, you can't – and the the challenge for me as an advocate, and this is one of the things that is a challenge for me, is that you want to say to them, you're not fine and you have to deal with this. And, and like, you know, you want to tell them what to do, but you can't. You know, they have to – they have to be the ones to actually want to get the help. And it's almost like drug addiction. Like you can't force them to get better until they're ready to. Um, exactly. You know, and, and, and you just have to be there to be, you know, a support. Um, so, yeah. And I give, you, I give you so much credit, Christine, uh, for, for being that advocate now and getting the information out because we've found that it's, it's education. It's making people aware of what's out there. It's providing education when they hear it or when a friend hears it, then that allows them to come to us uh, and, in a, and you're doing it in a greater way. And, and, you know, we're probably 20 years behind where domestic abuse was as far as recognition of, of what's happening. But you're showing us today that there's still not enough information out there for people to really seek it out and share it. But you've got the power back. It's like, it's like the time that, you know, when I knew what had happened, until I found out about scars, I was kind of out there trying to create something myself and thinking, this is overwhelming. It's just easier for me to just to hide, you know, get, yeah. just go behind that rock until I told my story once and that's when my stuff came flowing out. My girlfriends are like, oh no, this, you, you can't be the woman behind the smile anymore. You've got to get this out. And I'm really grateful that you, you've done what you, and you're doing what you're doing now because you're not that woman behind the smile anymore. You're the woman with the smile and the one giving credibility to what happened and power to the victims be that they'll become survivors and thrivers, but they can't do it alone. Yeah, I want to. Um, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to write a book. Um, I just don't know how. <laughs> One so, word at a time. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea where to even start with that. And I want to get my story out there. And 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 one of the things I want to do is speak at events and conferences as a survivor. Um, that's something that I really want to do because I, not just my sexual assault. I mean, I've been through a lot. I was in, you know, a five-year domestic violence relationship before I met my husband where it was awful. And and there's just been a lot. I was beat down mentally and physically to the point where I just felt like I wanted to give up because I was like, this is never going to change. Like, my life is going to constantly be like this. And I just wanted normalcy so bad. And what, now today my life looks very different and I, you know, I want people to know that it does not matter where you come from, who your family is, you know, what education level you have. Like if you're determined and you want more, like it is possible. I mean, I'm living my dream. I am literally living my life today that I used to lay in bed and dream about. And, and it's, it's possible for anybody because statistically – I mean, my boy, my kids, my daughter's 23 in college, my son's active duty Navy, um, my stepson, you know, we have, me and my husband together have seven children um, total. They're all thriving. They're amazing. And statistically, it shouldn't be like this. I mean, it shouldn't. And I just want people to know that it's possible and there's help out there and there's guidance and there's, they're like, just don't give up. Like, you know, that dream that you lay in bed and cry about, it's reachable. And, you know, I just, it, and I feel like if people hear my story and they hear that, you know, because people today meet me and they don't have any idea of the things that I've been through. And they just think that, you know, I went to school and I got a good job and that's it. But, you know, when they hear my story, it's, I've been told that it's inspired them and that makes me feel good. And I'm like, okay, like, let me get out there and let me try to help as many people as I can understand that you don't have to live by the words of what others speak over you. I wasn't the piece of crap that I was told I was. I wasn't useless. I wasn't worthless. I'm not. And, you know, it's sad when I see women or men in these situations and I know they can get out of it. So, you know, that's my, I believe that God led my life 
and led all these things that happened to me for my purpose, and my purpose is definitely to be support and help other people. I believe that 100% because there's no other explanation as to why all these horrible things would happen to me, and then God opened all these amazing doors today. Well, I couldn't have said any, of that any better, and that's why you're on the show today because we're all about standing up and speaking up and owning our gift, and our gift sometimes comes from the pain that we've had in our life which is now our passion and it is so empowering and strengthening and and I know you're going to make a lot of difference in the world and I'm so grateful that you know we were able to connect today and that we'll get you together with Dr. Tim and, and have some things going on with scars too because I think it's a great you know there's great yeah. synergy between what we're doing as advocates for change and for women in particular so thank you so much for being here thank you for your husband supporting you and so can I say something real fast sure um Chrissy gives a lot of, um, and I'm going to try and do this without um, getting upset, but Chrissy does a lot, says a lot about everybody else. Um, but I'm, I'm, I support her, but it, she took the, the steps. Like she made, she picked her foot up and she went, she went back to school. And her story doesn't just inspire victims and survivors, but it inspires me and our kids. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and I thank God that she was placed in my life because um, she's going to have an impact, and I am so blessed that she's in my life, and I just I just wanted to say that. Well, I appreciate yeah, that. Goodness, thank you. A lot of our victims are so afraid of what family are going to think when they speak up, and, and yeah. they need to hear that. Please, yes, please, please put it in the show. Um, like, she's amazing, and it's her strength. Like, I can't, I wish I could talk more about it, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but, like, he, she's, and, and, and she looks, like, it's amazing what she's accomplished. And, like, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't always that way. Like, it's, it's a journey, and, like, you need support, and there's, there's people like Chrissy that can help you along that journey that can say, hey, I was there, but now I'm here. And I had these people to help me. Like, you can't do it alone, and we're here to support you. But this is, like, the final, like, product of where you can be to take back your life. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Dr. Tim, for popping on. We're actually going to wind up this show. Uh, it's been an, another amazing Stand Up and Speak Up show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Chrissy, for being here. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you've been a victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS is, in, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based here in Miami, supporting scam victims worldwide. Chrissy works for the county in Monroe, Florida, or Monroe County, Florida, and we will get her information on the oh, Chrissy, before I let you go, how can people reach you? Let's make sure they got that information. Um, uh, email is honestly the best. Uh, you can email me at cdepree, it's D-E-P-R-E, 33 at yahoo.com. Okay, cdepree, 33 at yahoo.com. We will get you in connection with her. If you know anybody that has been abused in a domestic violence situation or home invasion, make sure you get them connected with Chrissy, too, because she has the credibility and the resources now to, to educate and assist. So this episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfo teaming products at BenfoComplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thanks everybody for being here today. Go to my website, TheWomanBehindTheSmile.com for additional information and resources. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Enjoy the replays. They are lots of fun. And enjoy your day. Keep safe, keep happy, and stand up and speak up and own your gift. Thanks, everybody.